we are going to take a look at Intel's and AMD's also oh friendly and easy to use websites. All right, and uh, if you want to pull up Lab 5, if you don't have that already up, what we're going to do, you can do this electronically and submit it online, is fill in uh, this chart that will kind of help us compare Intel and AMD desktop and laptop processors. And again, this is one of those things that you might do when you're deciding on a processor to buy when you're building a system or when you're looking at different systems that are already pre-built to try to decide which one you want for whatever purpose you're going to be using um, a computer for. Just out of curiosity, how many people here prefer Intel? How many prefer AMD? How many don't know yet? Okay, that's fine. Typically, when we think of processors for different uses, we tend to think of Intel for business use and AMD for casual or gaming use in many circumstances, although it can go either way. But what we're going to try to do when we look at the websites is figure out um, what characteristics each processor has so that we can kind of make a better comparison. In our second lab today, we're actually going to look at physical processors and you'll see that when you look at the information on each processor, it's very hard to do a direct comparison because Intel's pretty good about putting information on the processor, AMD not so much. Okay, and you'll find that true on their websites as well. It's a little hard to get to the point where you can find good information. The links that I've put out here are a little bit older, but if you follow this link to Intel and then um, take it a couple steps further, um, you can end up with the sixth generation um, Intel Core processors, which are the newest. These have just been released. And you can see that they've all come out in the third quarter, which means really, really new. Enlarge that a little bit. Um, and I can't really tell you how I got here. And I don't think it's going to let me tell you how I got here. Um, Pardon me? Is it okay that we just use the fourth gen? It is, but the sixth gen will give you some um, additional information as far as the newest processors, which here's the thing with, with both Intel and AMD. When they come out with their new generation, like the sixth gen, the fifth gen processors dramatically decrease in price. So you can get a very good performing processor of the prior generation, which is almost as good as the new generation that they're coming out with, but for, for less money. But I think you can look at the fourth gen if you want. I'm going to pull up the sixth gen here in desktops and see what kinds of information we can find. Okay, now Intel, once you get to this point, is fairly good about putting information out there. All right, so if I bring up the table, and actually I want to minimize this. I want to minimize this. Okay. Let's pull the 
this over a little bit. All right, if we're looking at these processors, um, to do a comparison, we want to start by looking at the family and number of the processor, which in this case is the Core i7, and I've picked up the 6700K here. Whatever model you're looking at will be a little different. And um, Jace, if you want to make sure everybody's finding what they need to find here. Um, if you scroll through the the information on Intel's website, you can usually find the number of cores and the number of threads. Now what's the difference between cores and threads when we're talking about a processor? What's the difference between a core and a thread when we're talking about a processor? Because somebody is bound to ask you this at some point when you're talking processors. Cores are the actual number of physical entire processors that are in a package. And a thread is the number of processes that a core can do at one time. So if you have four cores and each core can do two threads at a time, your total number of threads then is eight. Okay, so when you see four cores and eight threads, what that's telling you is that you have a true multi-processing processor. It's doing two actions at once. All right, why is that an advantage over a single thread? You guys know this. Why are two threads better than one? Because you get more done in the same amount of time. Okay? It's the same reason that two cores are better than one. You've got more processing that can be done at the same time. All right? Clock speed, um, on your chart, if you want to notice the base frequency, which is what the processor is going to be mainly rated as, your turbo frequency would be the speed at which they say it can be safely overclocked to. All right. Let's see, what else do we have here? Cash. Intel puts all of their cash together as eight megabytes of smart cash. That means the processor determines how much is gonna be level one, level two, and level three at any given point in time based on its need. Okay, so processors have gotten a little bit smarter because they can control their own cache. Architecture or lithography or what else is it sometimes called? CMOS, 14 nanometers. Anybody know what that's referring to? And why should we care? 14 nanometers is the size of the transistors on the actual processor itself. And are nanometers big or small? Small. If I tell you that three years ago, the lithography on many processors was 40 nanometers, you can see that we've gotten dramatically smaller with the size of the transistors. Now, what does that mean? The transistors are smaller, but the size of the core stays the same. You can get more transistors in a core. And the more transistors you get in a core, 
the more you can actually do with that processor because that determines how much work can actually be done. So the smaller number here is the better. What can we kind of infer from the fact that we're getting smaller as far as the architecture goes? How, how low do you think we can go? You think we can go much smaller? Probably not, because you run into, and this is where the physics come in, where I'm a little hazy, but um, you know that when you make something smaller and you pack them in more tightly, you're going to be generating more heat, okay? You're also reaching the limits of what the physical material that this stuff is made out of is capable of, okay? So they're looking at different materials that they can make processors out of where we don't run into these heat issues and these size issues. Have you ever heard of Moore's Law? It has to do with computers, okay? That basically we double the number of transistors every year and a half on a processor. We've surpassed that just recently, okay? And it's because we've been able to shrink the size of stuff and get more on a processor. But that's been true, Moore's Law has held true since the, basically the very beginning of personal computers, which is kind of an interesting thing, because I'm sure Mr. Moore never believed we would get to this point in terms of what processors were capable of. Socket type and pin count. You want to go down and look under the package specifications. It will generally tell you the um, socket supported and an FCLGA stands for Flip Chip Land Grid Array. So with this type of processor, are the pins going to be on the bottom of the processor or in the socket if it's a land grid array? Inside the socket. Hmm? Inside the socket because the processor will be flat on the bottom. It's got the little flat contacts on it. The advantage to that is when you stick it in the socket, you're not running the risk of damaging any of those little pins. When we looked at processors uh, to identify components, you see these little pins here. Um, if you put these in the socket incorrectly, you will bend or even break some of these off. And then, of course, this is toast. It just makes a nice little toy. All right. Um, so the land grid array meant that the flat parts were on the processor and not um, so easily damaged. The number in Intel's um, socket name usually tells you how many pins or contacts are in the processor. And that's one way you can see if a processor is compatible with a particular motherboard. If you've got a motherboard that has a socket that's an FCLGA 1151, you can use this particular processor in that motherboard. They have to be compatible. Another thing that you typically want to know is what type of memory can be used with it. Okay. Now this particular processor can work with up to 64 gigabytes of RAM depending on the type of memory. It will work with DDR4 running at Let's see if I can get this. These different speeds. And why is that important? If your RAM isn't running at the same or compatible speed with your front side bus, okay, if this is faster than your front side bus, your front side bus can't handle it and you will have system instability. 
if this is slower than your front side bus, you're still going to be okay. All right, it's sort of like trying to speed down the interstate, which I know you guys never do, right? Don't ride with me. Um, not if you're very law abiding, I guess. I don't speed much. Anyway, theoretically, you shouldn't go faster with your RAM than your front side bus is capable of. And your front side bus and your processor, remember, have that proportional relationship called the multiplier. All right. So this is going to tell us what kinds of RAM slots we should look for on a motherboard we want to put this processor in. We want a motherboard that's capable of either DDR4 running at either of those speeds or DDR3 with those particular speeds and voltage in the RAM slots. If a motherboard doesn't have that, even though the socket is compatible, this processor will not work well on it. Okay. So there are some things you have to think about when you're looking at that particular uh, configuration. So when we get down here to bus core ratio or system bus speed, we're actually looking at these numbers. Because ideally your front side bus speed or your system bus speed is going to match your RAM speeds. So for this particular uh, specification, you can use these numbers. Now, is this a 32-bit or 64-bit processor? 64-bit. Most processors now are going to be 64-bit unless you're buying something um, that's been around for quite a while. And how much does this cost, this brand new processor right out of the box? $350. That's an incredible price, actually, for a new processor. When you look at some of the other processors available, you can see that sometimes a new processor can run close to $1,000, which is why you don't want to damage them. Right. $350, still a nice chunk of change, but a little bit more affordable. So that would be the cost of the CPU, of the processor itself. All right. I want to take you over to AMD's website, um, which was a little bit harder to find information on. Um, I started at AMD APUs here. and did a little bit of clicking. AMD also has now the A-Series, which is their sixth generation of processors. And I wanted feature details here. I think this is the one. not. This is why I say AMD is not as user friendly as Intel because you just can't get to where you want to be. So I'm going to try it this way.
This gives me some of the information I'm looking for, but not all of it. If I find the other page, um, I will get back to that. But for this desktop processor, the family in the model is the A10. It's got four CPU processors, so it's a quad core. Now, what AMD also lists are the GPUs. What does the GPU stand for? Your graphics processing units. This is a relatively recent development where they put the graphics processor not on the motherboard or in your video card, but in your main processor. Why is that an advantage? Gamers especially, why is that an advantage? Because then you will be able to utilize it along with your graphics card. Exactly. The processing of the graphics becomes more closely tied with the processing of the rest of the system so that you're, you're keeping up with your graphics display, basically. It makes graphics faster. It also enables them to make graphics more sophisticated because you've got the processing power to interpret that. So even though this says 12 compute cores, really your CPU is only four cores. This one's running at 3.9 gigahertz. Take socket FM2 plus. It's got a level two cache of four, <coughs> excuse me, four meg. Well, let's see if I can get back to that other. If you scroll down on that page and choose one of the sellers that's actually selling it, like I put down that new rack one. Here? No, uh, the one a little farther down. That's new egg. Scroll down a little bit more. Oh, right regular new egg. And then it'll give you a little bit more specification. The nice thing about Newegg, and this is where you go if you can't find it on the manufacturer's website. Come to Newegg and look under the Specs tab because it's going to give you just about everything that you need. Now it's not telling us, oh it is telling us, the manufacturing tech is the same as the lithography. So if you were putting the AM, a, this AMD processor side by side with the Intel one I just looked at, what would you say about the transistor sizes on this one? Bigger. Bigger. Twice as big, in fact. But does that necessarily mean that this is a worse processor? No. Okay. So this is... This is why it's kind of, it's still kind of apples to oranges in a way when you're comparing Intel to AMD. Because Intel has so many GP, or because AMD has so many GPUs, this might be a better processor for gaming. And the Intel might be a better processor for business apps. Unless you're running something like CAD or other computer-aided drawing or video editing or something like that, then you might go with AMD instead. Okay? So it depends a lot of times on what you want to do with the particular computer in terms of which processor you want to pick. All right? I'm going to give you a little time to go ahead and look at the laptop processors that are available. And you can pick any laptop processor of any generation for these. Um, typically you may find that laptop processors cost a little more. Why is that? They're smaller. Why should they cost more? They have to be more heat efficient. Okay, they have to be more heat efficient. What else is an advantage that a laptop processor has over a desktop. It has more um, battery layers. Okay, they run at a lower voltage, which means your battery lasts longer. And it's more expensive to make them this way. Okay. They're getting closer in terms of cost. 
But again, if you're looking at a laptop for business use or a laptop for gaming, you're going to find the same kind of considerations. AMD might have the edge for gaming, Intel for business. With that being said, it's not that you can't do gaming on an Intel processor. You can. You can do it very well. And AMD make good business processors. All right, looking at lab six, we're going to be looking at actual physical processors and some photos of new ones, uh, newer ones. Um, usually this stuff is all donated, so we go with what I can get my hands on. I would like to have some of the newest processors, but nobody's killed any yet. So if you happen to kill one and you can't RMA it, I'm always looking for newer dead parts. All right, so processor number one is filled out on your lab sheet, okay? And this is where we got the information. The name and the model, or the chip type, would be the name and the model. This is an Intel Pentium one of the very first Pentiums, so that's now known as the Classic Pentium. Which came out, as you can see down here, under the copyright, 1992-93. So 20-some years old by now. Amazing, all right? The next thing is the CPU speed. Now this can be kind of hard to find on Intel processors, but it is there. And in fact, it's 133. So it's here, it's on the back, in two different places. And somebody actually wrote it on the processor, 133. <coughs> All right. Now, Level 2 cache. 
There is no level 2 cache in this processor. That didn't come until we get to the Pentium Pro, which is newer than this. So no level 2 cache for this particular processor. And as far as the socket and the slot, I'm going to give one for the two of you here. I did print out all that many of these. If you three guys can share. Fine. See if the classic Pentium is on there. And what does it say for socket or slot? Four or five. Okay, and that would be the SPGA. Now the SPGA means it's a staggered pin grid array. Notice how these don't line up like little soldiers. They're offset from each other. When you put them that way, you can actually get more pins on a chip than you can if they are straight up and down. Okay, so now that we're getting smaller pins and more pins, we're kind of going back to the plain PGA, the straight up and down. But in this particular generation, we staggered them to get more on. This was, um, the Intel Pentium was a big deal when it came out because it was a 32-bit processor. It could run Windows 95 very easily. And the 486 processors which came before them were not so good with 32-bit processing. They were okay, but the Pentium really made Windows 95 at the time work very well. Okay, so over on the benches I've got uh, one, two, three, five physical processors and six photos. Before I set you loose on that, let's take a look at an AMD processor. Okay, here's the deal with AMD. We can get, this is processor number six, we can get the name, chip type, and model right off the very first line. So it's an Athlon 64 FX. All right. There is nothing on there that indicates CPU speed like Intel does. What we need to do for the rest of the information is look at the model number which is in the second line. The model number is actually this whole thing. But if you take the ADA FX60, that's the main part of the model number. To get specific information on this processor, you have to Google that. Okay? There is a method for determining what the AA6CD means but you need to go to another website to find that out anyway, so Googling is faster. All right. So let's say we do that. Look at that. I must have done this before. Okay. Here we have the FX60 running at 2.6 gigahertz for speed. We've got a socket 939. And our level 2 cache is 2 times 1 megabyte for a total of 2 megs of level 2 cache. Okay. 
much easier than trying to figure out what the codes meant on this processor because all of these numbers here stand for something with AMD but unless you have the cheat sheet it's faster to go straight to Google there is another um, AMD processor out there so again you'll want to come back um, to your to your desk to look that up on the other ones when you're looking at the processors usually for Intel there's a line of, of type up at the top and if you look for an X, usually the number after the X is the processor speed. And if there's a number after that, that is usually the level to cache. Okay. So come on up here. You can start anywhere. Just make sure you're filling in the right line on the worksheet. Um, to go with the corresponding processors. And Jason and I will come over and help you if you get stuck with anything. The Pentium Pro was the first to have cache in the processor package and not on the motherboard. Okay. Prior to the Pentium Pro, the cache was on the motherboard and that meant it took longer to go to cache than it did once they put the cache in the processor package. So that made things faster. Did anybody find out which was the first non-server processor to have a level 3 cache? Yes? Intel Pentium 6? Even before that. Intel Pentium 4. Pentium 4. Okay. Specifically, the Extreme Edition was the very first, but the Pentium 4s. And again, the more cache you have, the more stuff can be available to be worked on. What are the names of Intel's and AMD's budget lines of processors? Page 171 has the answer, but go ahead, Justin. Intel Core i7. Those are the mainstream. Which are the ones that are meant for budget systems? For desktops. Go ahead. Um, Celeron for Intel and Sempron. Sem right. And Celeron for Intel. Sempron for AMD. So usually those will be the processors that didn't run as fast or have as much working, working cash as some of the other ones. When manufacturers look to build a processor, they build a whole bunch of them. And they say, this is the core that we're using. Then they test them. And some of them work better than others. The ones that work the best get the high-end names the ones where maybe all of the cash doesn't work or they don't run as fast, they get the budget names. There's really not that much difference. It's just in how they actually perform once they want them to be usable. How are mobile processors different than desktop processors? Go ahead. Okay. And um, because from the laptop, you can take them anywhere. Right. Okay. So they need to be, um, they generally run at lower voltage, so they're more electricity efficient. They generally generate less heat, which means what two things when you're talking about a laptop? If they don't use as much electricity, what? Well, they they can be comparable in processing power, but if they don't use as much electricity, what advantage does that? 
what lasts longer? Your battery lasts longer between recharges. And because they don't generate as much heat, that means you actually can use them on your lap without burning yourself. Okay, so those are advantages um, when we're looking at, at mobile processors. Also, you don't need as robust a cooling system, so that means they don't weigh as much. What if you want to upgrade the processor on your motherboard? What are some things that you have to think about in terms of compatibility? Front side bus speed. What else? Hmm? The, socket. the socket. Do you have the right socket, or do you, did you buy the right processor for the socket you have? Voltage is another issue. Does your processor socket supply the right voltage for the processor you want to use? What would happen if the socket actually <laughs> supplied more voltage than your processor could handle? You would fry your processor. Yep. It would <laughs> scorch, literally. So that would be bad. What's your multiplier if your front side bus runs at 1,033 megahertz and your processor runs at 2.53 gigahertz? There will be a decimal in this number. 2.45. 2.45. Basically, remember, you have to translate your gigahertz into megahertz and then divide your front side bus speed into your processor speed. And that gets you 2.45. Four, five-ish. A little more than two for your multiplier. Okay. So, do you have a little bit better handle on the differences and the similarities between processors now, especially if you're looking at AMD compared to Intel? Now when someone asks you what processor you have in your computer, you can say, I have a Pentium or an Intel Core i7 running at this speed, and it can support up to this much RAM, and it's in this socket, and I could upgrade to this processor on my motherboard because it would be compatible. You can sound really geeky now. Although you want to be careful where you pull that out and start talking about it, because some people won't appreciate it yet. Okay.